So today we have Chef Amelia Saltzman with us, distinguished author of the Santa Monica Farmer's Market Cookbook, which I don't know if you guys have, I love, and the new Seasonal Jewish Kitchen. So they let me play today. First time, I'm gonna be back here. Um, hopefully we're gonna have a great time. Thank y'all for being here. Thank you for joining us. Welcome well, to Google. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. My two favorite words, food literacy. That is, my, that is my passion. And you know, I learn right along with everyone else as I do my work. And then the result of that is the Seasonal Jewish Kitchen, my new cookbook that really took me one step, no, many, many millennia back to what we do today, seasonal, sustainable cooking as a way to um, make our lives easier, simply, simpler, healthier, you know, and by the way, save the planet. It's all right there in how we cook. And what I discovered is that that, what we do today, has really ancient roots. Really exciting to me. That's my new food literacy right here. To us as well, yeah. Very important to Google mm. all of those things. So what I want to do today is I want to show you some simple tricks and techniques that are really gonna make that so much easier to get dinner on the table um, at home after a busy day and answer all those questions we just talked about. And I'm so delighted to be cooking with you today. Me too. I know, friends of the kitchen, it's great. Today we're gonna do two recipes from the seasonal Jewish kitchen. Yemenite pumpkin carrot soup well, with a, well today we're doing a parsley pesto to top it off. And this is a Middle Eastern tweak on a, on a classic kind of fall winter soup, right? And the other recipe we're gonna do is an apple, fennel, and watermelon radish salad. Refreshing, gorgeous counterpoint to winter dishes if we actually got winter. Sounds amazing. So I think we should get started. Let's go. So we're gonna start with the soup and um, this, I like to consider this a master recipe. I think everything should be sort of like have a template that you can then use in a lot of different ways. So we're always going to start with aromatics. We want to build flavor. Jen, if you want to get the pot heated, uh, this nice big wide soup pot, um, I think it's over here, yeah. right? Oh, you know this stuff well. Notoriously tricky stoves. Yeah, so maybe you have you know, to be gonna... smarter than the average Googler to use them. And we always want to start with an onion. Uh, well, no, we shouldn't say we'll always start with an onion, but if you eat onions, it's a great way to start. And um, I like to cut it in half. And then you can just peel back the layers. Right? And Jenna, if you want to cut an onion as well, I think we'll just probably use one in the soup that we're cooking today. And I like to simply cut, I leave the root end attached, protecting my fingers, and then I turn the onion and chop. So we just need a gentle, home-style, medium chop to our onion. And once, and I guess we'll make that a dump bowl, right? For compost later. And once the pot is warm, so we want to warm the pot, and then we're going to add our onion. And we've also gotten some celery. Now, celery is a really lovely aromatic. It's got great celery, has a terrific flavor. So let's start with some oil. Um, we're going to use it. Do you think that's hot? Well, we'll find out. We'll see it. Let's see if the oil shimmers. Why, yes, it is. That's what you're looking for. When the pot is hot but not smoking, you're going to get the oil. It's going to liquefy and start to shimmer. And when you put something in, you'll get a nice sizzle, which will start flavors building. So we're going to go ahead and add celery. And be sure to look for those tender leaves in the middle. Um, the tender stalks that are whiter and the pale green leaves, they add a lot of flavor. And <clears throat> we're going to add 
We're going to add a couple of chopped carrots. I love this great combination of carrots together with pumpkin because what I find is that the carrot really balances the flavor of the winter squash. Sometimes squash can be a little vegetal and, um, and this way it, it uh, sort of tones it down and really makes it very nice. Um, and we finally chop them so they can get lots of all around, um, we can develop color and, and uh, flavor right away. So we're gonna let those um, cook medium heat. We don't want them to brown, but we want them to get really soft. And here's a simple trick. Great cooking is as simple as adding salt in layers. Salt as you go. So let's say you want a teaspoon of salt in the whole recipe, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon right now. It's very different than just dumping a teaspoon at the end. I always wonder about that, whether to, I feel like you should salt ingredients individually and, and then layer the flavors, but some say add it at the end. I, I like the idea yeah. of building yeah. it in. Yes, Absolutely. it really makes, you try it. You try, try the experiment. So while we'll let that, we don't want, we just want to let it go gently. And let's talk about the squash that we're going to add. So anybody ever try to um, cut a raw squash? <laughs> you better right. have a sharp knife for your right. end of story. Yes, not so easy. So here's the trick. A home, a home cook's best trick. Don't cut it. Put it in a hot oven, 375, something like that, whole, on a sheet pan. You can protect it with foil or parchment if you like. Just shove that baby into a hot oven until it's soft. And then, I think I'm going to let you do the honors. Okay, Jenna? I want you to just... Cut it. You can use the knife of your choice. Right over the top. Right, right now. Right the top off. Right, just, or right in the middle. Yeah, right through the equator. Wow, oh, much easier than last time I cut a squash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you all see? Y'all got a good look. So then, let's see. I'm gonna grab a spoon. Then it's really a very simple matter to simply. Scoop out the seeds. Oh, look at that. You can save the seeds, of course, if you like, to roast or plant. And then you can, now this recipe would call for three cups of, um, of uh, squash, which I would prefer weighing, so you just scoop it right on, onto a scale till you get to, oh, we're in grams. So we're gonna do about 750 grams. I don't know if we're gonna have enough in this small squash, but that'll be fine, right? So there you go, instant squash puree. And do you need to prick it or anything like that? Nothing. Literally throw it in. Just literally throw it in. You might wipe it down if it's well. got a lot of dirt from the garden, but that's it. <laughs> That's it. Would that work you know, for a spaghetti squash, do you think? It would. It works for any squash. Now, the smaller squashes, you can easily you can easily cut in half, like a butternut squash. Those aren't that hard to cut in half. And like those a pumpkin be, or something. Right. Big acorn squash. Or, right. Do you see? Oh, until it's soft. So it might take, like this might have taken an hour. The thing, the question was, how long? So that's the thing about dealing with sort of the properties of natural foods, whole foods, which is that um, every everyone is a little bit different. This might be drier, it might be more dense, it might be more watery. But you do want to look for a squash like this that um, like a kabocha, something like that that has a lot of starch and not a lot of water. Not a Halloween. Um, well, we'll have this ready to go. Great. Um, not, um, not a jack-o'-lantern. So after carving, don't cook it. Well, those aren't designed for cooking. There are a lot of great squashes out there that are. 
So we can see what's happening here is that we're developing, the color is heightening, if you can see, and it's really telling us that it's bringing the flavor out. Smells amazing. Already, Love you know? <clears throat> so we can add, you can also make the soup with um, raw cut up squash. If you have a strong friend, okay? A lot of work. Do you find there's any difference texturally or in timing wise or anything if you're doing it with raw? You know, I prefer I prefer to cook with something roasted because I've already caramelized yeah. and um, the flavors and, and the and reduced the moisture so that I have the natural sugars concentrated in flavors. And I think that is kind of one of another key key um, trick. It's not hard to do. Now, roasting vegetables is perhaps my favorite kitchen technique. It is. It it's is. It's so easy. It is so delicious. You can do it with everything, and everybody's always like, I've never had a vegetable this tasty before. That's exactly right. You need one sheet pan, a little bit of olive oil, some great salt, and then the world's your oysters. Pretty much. Whatever is at the farmer's market, roast it. Right. And it all tastes different. And it's all delicious. All right, so I think we're going, we're ready for our next step. Okay. So now we've built our first layer of flavor. We're going to add the squash, and we're going to add some seasoning. Um, we're gonna add a little more salt. So Jenna, if you wanna give a little. Now, <clears throat> what, what makes this soup, a Yemenite soup in particular, is the blend of spices that were used, and this is um, hawaj, which is a Yemenite blend of coriander and cumin and black pepper. Black pepper is used a lot in Yemen. And <clears throat> the, um, and also turmeric, which adds a yellow color. Um, let's see, what else? Turmeric, cloves you might have. So it's this very, Fragrant. Very fragrant, aromatic. I wouldn't quite go to floral, but but getting there. Yeah. And really distinctive. And so we're just we're creating a simple soup, and yet we're elevating it a little bit with something maybe we don't eat every day. Okay, squash in. Squash in, okay. and let's give a good dose of this. Now, if you don't have hawaj, which is available in Middle Eastern stores, I basically use. Um, a mix of coriander and cumin and black pepper and you'll be good to go. So again, layering flavor, we're bringing it up. By cooking it, we haven't added any liquid Smells yet. amazing. Can you all smell? Oh man, I already sense waves <laughs> flying out to all of you. <clears throat> all right, and now we're going to ladle in some stock. Now, if you can, <clears throat> if you can, heat the stock first. It'll get your cooking going faster. Um, if you don't have time, you don't want to use the pot, don't. We can just chicken stock? Right, and we're using vegetable stock. Huh? So this is a soup that just happens to be Veg vegan. Oh, vegan. I love, I love added it. added value. Yeah, absolutely. Go, go for flavor first and then added value. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Um, chicken stock would be great. That would make it even more Yemenite. Savory. And savory yeah. and, and that Yemenite quality. So we're gonna Ready? add about four cups. Okay. And we're gonna let that simmer. And here's another home cooked trick. While something is simmering, long task, untended, do something else. So we're <laughs> going. <laughs> time management. Time management. So we're going to, the next thing we're going to do is make our pesto. So <clears throat> this lovely condiment um, will dress up a soup. It will dress up a whole lot of things. It's very nice. You can make it either with, um, thank you, chef. You can either make it with parsley, as we're doing today, or cilantro, which is very, very nice. Um, so a good handful of leaves, I would say, maybe a quarter cup packed. And I think what we're going to do is... Do I need to turn this down for simmer? Um, Let it. We're gonna, well, we'll bring it up to a good simmer. Now and you know what, let's throw, in, 
Let's throw in mm. a handful of these. Now, here's another little trick. When they're whole and you cook them down, they will just get sweeter. Melty. Melty sweet, as opposed to chopping and releasing all of those, all of the pungency. So we're gonna add a couple of cloves of garlic here. I think I'm gonna give them a rough chop first. So this is a very simple condiment. <clears throat> And you'll notice really that we are, other than the spice mix, we are flavoring food with food. We are using the ingredients from the farmers. I love that way to, to say it. Flavoring food with food. Not additives, other food. <laughs> exactly. So simple, but a little bit profound these days when you think about it. Hmm. And we need about a teaspoon of salt. We're making a nice condiment. And we'll take the olive oil. And is this plugged in? Yep. Yep. Looks like it. Okay. So we're going to work in, oh, about a third or a half a cup of olive oil. And um, if you want to start um, grinding that up. Throw the outboard motor in there. Mm -hmm. All right. Stick blender, another cook's favorite tool. This, this will keep. And so I love using this. This will keep in your refrigerator. I would make a, um, um, I would make a tri double, triple batch of this Still and just thing. use it on grilled chicken, just wherever you need a hit. And it's going to be our final flavor layer on the top, right? And I want to get our apple, our salads. You know, we forgot to add parsley to the soup. I'm just going to throw this. <laughs> uh, you know, this is how you cook it. I'm up. Parsley. Looks perfect to me. Can you all see how gorgeous that is? What kind of, are we texturally... Chef, is this texturally what we're going for? Do we need yes, to emulsify no, more? Yes, no, I think Looks that's good? lovely. Excellent. Okay, easy to drizzle, just, just lovely. So we'll set that aside. So this is ready to go on our soup and we're done. So let's make our salad. You ready? Yes, ma'am. Really great tool. You use this tool? Love, love, it. love. Just don't get your finger. Oh, I'm gonna show you a trick for that too. <laughs> Okay, so, and I like to work right into the bowl, so we'll leave that here, and we'll start with radishes. So this is our apple, fennel, and watermelon radish salad, and I get so tired of people. It's like, oh, it's December, I can't get good tomatoes, I don't know what to do, right? Well, buy what's, what's ready, and there are so many salads to have. Watermelon radishes, what a surprise inside. Sometimes it's nice to give them a little peel. If we, oh, here we go. One to you. Um, because sometimes it releases the pretty color. So it really does, it doesn't taste like a watermelon. It tastes, it looks like a watermelon, but it's a lovely radish. And you know, we eat with our eyes. Just got one of these in my CSA box this week. Ah, uh, CSA. It's the perfect excuse to do the salad. Well, and you know what I love about a CSA box is, first of all, besides supporting your local farmers who certainly need our help, don't they, with this crazy yeah, climate? Yeah, especially, yeah. But it forces me to, well, not forces, but it gives me an excuse to cook things I might not have necessarily cooked before or that I wouldn't might be intimidated to pick up at the store, the farmer's market. Well, and I think that's a very good point because there's so many things people say, oh, we don't have that. And I'm thinking, you I probably do. You just <laughs> never noticed it. It yeah. was hiding in plain sight. Yeah. So these are quite large, but you can see. So pretty. Has everybody seen the inside of a watermelon mm -hmm. radish? So incredibly beautiful. I mean, why not? Look at what nature has given us. We might as well take advantage. Thank goodness right? farmers are giving it to us. Well, and all radishes are not, you know, white and red little globes of crunchiness. So 
these radishes already had their stems removed, but what I like to do is leave an inch of the stem attached. That's, That's your, your handle. handle. Natural handle. Love it. So we'll just stop a little early. So then what happens is this, this tool makes for fast slicing, but also wonderful texture. It's thin, it's lovely. So when you taste the salad, you're gonna have all this wonderful contrast in each bite. The pungent radish. And uniform, right? So if you are doing like a gratin or something where you need all your slices. So now you're getting fancy. Well, I should say, <laughs> no. Seasonal dishes. So if you want to sure. get us a couple of radishes into there, and here you go, if you finish those, I'm going to start with the next flavor component, fennel. So now we have some great big bulbs of fennel. And can I have that scissors back? Can somebody reach me that scissors? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So again, flavoring food with food. Here is our fennel bulb. You might say, well, what does this have to do with seasonal Jewish cooking? Well, fennel is actually traditionally a Jewish vegetable. It may be. Is it really? It is. It, it may be iconic to Italian cooking, but it wasn't until the beginning of the 19th century that it became a mainstream Italian food, which I think is kind of interesting. Fascinating. Food literacy. Hey. New factoid. So it's got a sweet and slightly licorice quality to it. So it's really different. It's very complex. Um, and of course, the fronds are lovely. We're going to be able to save some of those and use them in our salad. So again, we're going to remove this for now. I've already left my handle. I'm going to cut it in, um, <clears throat> in half. I'm going to, if it has a big, tough core, you can cut some of that out. And then I like to remove the tougher outer layers to make for a more tender salad. And this happens to have lobes. And then we're ready to grate, and this is my handle. Oh, right? Okay, there you go. Right in here with these radishes. Right in there. We're making the salad right into the bowl. And I'll just get those ready for you. Okay, there you go. And I'm gonna move right on to, to the apples. So now we've got this sort of um, slightly licorice, crisp, crunchy fennel going on. And now, of course, are lovely. These look like pink ladies. Mm. One of my favorites. We're going to get this sweet tart and beautiful color. Trick, trick alert, to core an apple quickly for this purpose. I'm going to cut it in half. I'm going to cut it in quarters. And then I'm just going to cut out the core. Okay? Without another knife. Very, very cool. Very cool, right? And so then that's just ready to cut into these wonderful little pieces. So we'll use a couple of apples. And then the other piece we're going to put in this salad is um, we're going to use some lovely winter salad greens. Now, you know, leafy things, there's more than lettuce. There's more than lettuce. So in winter we have a lot, it's, it's really fascinating to me because in winter we have leafy greens that taste like winter. You know, they're a little meatier, they're heartier, they might have spice to them, mm. all the things we like at this time of the year. And um, when, when we add those to a salad, and we're serving them with winter fare, hearty stew, things like that. It just feels right. And one of the things that I noticed was as when I was doing the book is that the foods that we want to eat, that we gravitate toward during the holiday season, tend to be the foods historically that, of course, are in season 
we just kind of lost track somewhere along the line. Well, now, with the way food is sold today, it's very easy to misunderstand what is and isn't in season, especially yes. if you don't look at where it's coming from. Precisely. Precisely. And that's why it's really important for us to educate ourselves and to really use all our senses, use our smarts. We forget when it comes to food, sometimes we don't trust our instincts. Yeah. And our if in the tomatoes are white, it's probably not the time to buy a tomato. You think? You think? Whatever looks and smells the best is probably in season. So I'm going to add just some of this. I think we're good. Yeah? Yeah, I think we've got... Beautiful. So I'm going to use the best stirring tool known to man and womankind. Everybody has two of them. I'm gauging what I want to do here. I don't want this to be a greens salad with a few little things. I want lots of texture. So I've, I've kind of looked to see how much, what my balance is. But you can kind of see what's happening. So maybe, is it equal parts of everything or? Something, something like, I would say we ish. went for two-ish of everything and then a couple of handfuls-ish of everything. Okay. So, and we're going to go with that other lovely autumn and winter um, sort of essence walnuts, mm. toasted walnuts. And you know why you toast them? You toast them to develop flavor. How's our soup doing? It looks glorious. So a nice handful. Toast better. them 350 degrees, about 10 minutes. They are, the flavor comes up, the aroma comes up. You'll know. I like to season a salad right in the bowl. You don't need to make a another dressing. You don't need another bowl. A couple of good squeezes. All you need is a tablespoon or two, right? Of oil, you can always add more. And walnut oil in this case? Walnut oil, which I love. Be sure and get a good one yeah. because it's, an, it's a flavor component. And let's see, salt. Now I'm using kosher salt here, but what would be, what would be really nice is a, a crunchy finishing salt like Malden um, or fleur de sel, but Malden is particularly nice. Again, a generous pinch or two, and you can always add more. And flavoring food with food. Five whole zester, not a big deal but it does this wonderful thing. Do it right over the salad. It releases, I can see the spray. Yeah, spraying up. Yeah, can you smell it? Even from there, right? And it just adds this beautiful, beautiful, long strands there. It's beautiful, but it's adding flavor and mouthfeel. Then, We can just give a nice squeeze of lemon. And that, my friends, is the salad dressing. Do we have something that we're going to toss this with besides our hands? I'm sure. A couple of wooden spoons or sure. some tongs. Or what do we think? Thank you. And meanwhile, I'm going to give, the, give a little haircut with these wonderful fronds right into the salad. You can save the rest of the fronds for using with fish, wrapping fish, it's wonderful. Wrapping fish, that's a fun one. Oh, this smells so bright and fragrant. It really is a, a lovely component of a winter meal. I'm seeing my Christmas salad come together. <laughs> Oh, at the end, the, the options are endless. Well, I knew I wanted something with these notes. This is, hmm. now I can say, I learned it from a professional. <laughs> um, you know, man, let's make it even more beautiful. If we take one of those platters. And then what I think is wonderful, I think a salad is so beautiful, mounded so that you really can appreciate every yes. beautiful thing that you've put in this salad, right? And oh, look at that wonderful lemon zest just, just drifting off everywhere. 
really beautiful. Isn't that nice? It's and just so easy. Okay, so now we've got our salad ready. And you know, this salad, the nice thing about winter ingredients, this salad can sit. You can just make it, it'll be fine for an hour or so while you do something else. Right. It'll be fine even for a couple hours, which is really right. nice. So meantime, let's finish our soup. So what we've got, well, this looks pretty soft, but we can finish. Well, let's see, let's take a taste and see what we've got. Okay, so by the magic of by the magic of Chef Didi, <laughs> we are going to, so we're gonna puree this one. Okay. All right. So let's see, we need our blend, our stick blender. Gotcha. And um, I don't know how hot this is underneath. That's no, fine. So, wherever you like. Oh, wherever we have a, a good visual. Can you all see what we're doing here? All right. Yes, no, move it. <laughs> we'll move it over there. All right. Move to this one so we can. There we go. All so right. Again, we can. So we're just now, you can see this soup, um, Chef made this with the raw squash. So you can see we have these nice, soft um, cubes of, of squash that have given their Given they're all to the soup. <laughs> and let's see. And just puree right in the pot. And we're going to need our soup bowls. Yes. So as you puree the soup, if it feels like it's too thick, then you can thin it with more stock. Mm -hmm. Consistency wise, this one is much thicker. Which are we going for? Well, somewhere in between. I haven't finished pureeing this one. So this one I probably a little bit more be stock. adding more. But yeah. I would I would be adding more stuff. You can always add more, but if you start with too much, yeah, then you then you have boiled vegetables. <laughs> You can do this in a in a blender, in a regular stand blender, um, but I'm going to need that spatula so we can plate this. this is, uh, ladle? Ladle, sorry. Yeah. Um, so now we have our beautiful soup. The thing about using a stand blender is that you have more to wash and you have to wait until the soup cools off a little. You have a little more you don't want it to explode on you. So here we go. Doesn't that chest look like autumn? Smell good? Yeah. And then why don't we drizzle a little bit on there? Yeah, just feel your inner Picasso. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Picasso. It's a little excited. And there we go. So this, this last layer of flavor has built it so that it's not the same as if we had made it and put it inside. It just, when we eat it, which is ready now, it just adds a lot more magic. And it's not hard to do, and it's no. so pretty, right? Yeah, well, and I love doing the pesto right in the jar. Speaking of not washing more things or exactly. having a food processor. My food processor has so many pieces, and then you have to wash them all. That's brilliant. Anyway, so And that's it looks it. beautiful. All right, so here we are, aren't we clever. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any questions? Questions? What's the best way to make vegetable stock? Right. And make right. it tasty. Because no offense, but. 
great question. So in the book, I do have a recipe for a simple vegetable stock, two things. You can either make it the way we started the soup, saute all the ingredients first and add the water in batches. Okay, again, avoiding the, the boiled vegetable taste. So add air and liquid. It. Right, add the liquid, half of the liquid. You can add more and just let it be very concentrated. If you wanna take a little more time, our other favorite technique, roast the vegetables first for about 45 minutes. So you've got some browning, it'll make a more robust squash uh, stock and then start your soup. Okay, then add, and then put it in a pot and cook it. Um, and again, adding enough salt, uh, salt and allowing it to be dense with vegetable. Yeah, what vegetables actually form your base for your stock? The stock, okay, what are the vegetables for the stock? Um, certainly onions, carrots, celery, parsley, all right? And then uh, leeks, Mm. In addition, which are not quite the same as onions, right? So adding a sweetness, keep those green tops in there. Um, a piece of butternut squash is great. A couple of tomatoes or sun-dried tomatoes oh. to give you umami, that mm. sort of meaty quality. Mushroom is I was just going to say or... a few dried mushrooms yeah. would be excellent. Just, you can, add, you can add a lot of things. You can add... Pea, ten pea tendril tops, pea oh. um, shoots, know, shoots yeah. and so on. But anything that's very odiferous, like I wouldn't put broccoli or cauliflower, they're too strong. If you want to use um, the woody ends of asparagus, that's fine, particularly if you're making an asparagus soup. Sure. Very flavorful. Layer that in, right? Right. On the base. But it's very flavorful. So, but, but yes. Lots of vegetables. So lots of freedom. Riff on it. Yes. What you have in the house will work. The citrus. Isn't that nice? It just pops. So you've got a lot of contrast in color, flavor, and texture. Yeah. I feel like acid is one of those elements that will take a dish next level and really impress your <laughs> friends and family. Just enough acid. Just so that hint, that bright hint of acid. Yes. And that, that is key. I think that's one of the things we don't think about when we make salads. Yeah. Which is we overdress. We over vinegar and we get very complicated. And if we have flavorful ingredients, we should just get out of their way. Simple, simple. How long do you roast walnuts? Um, at 350, I would say five to 10 minutes. I would check them after five. Um, but you really, it probably at 350, probably take close to 10 minutes. Um, you want them to be fragrant, and when you cut into one, you should see a little bit of color. They will continue to um, cook from their own residual heat. They have a lot of oil. So once you take them out of the oven, they're going to continue to brown, so, and you want them to have color, but not to be dark. I almost always burn the first batch. It's one of those tasks you can't get distracted when you're doing it because it'll go from perfect to yucky in about a second. And I like to do it in the oven. I think you have the most control. And I think also you have... Um, Surface area exposed to exactly. heat. Yeah. Exactly. And that's really a key for any roasting. One of the things we should talk about, size matters. So you notice we used a wide pot. So when you have a wide, a lot of surface area, you have a lot of evaporation and a lot of flavor concentration. When you're making the vegetable stock and you want to have a lot of liquid, a deeper pot is usually more helpful. Same thing when you're roasting vegetables. You know, nice big, those half sheet pans we were using, your best friend. Yeah. And leave room. If you pile them one on top of the other, the vegetables one on top of the other, you're going to steam them. So in, in the Santa Monica Farmer's Market cookbook, I actually wrote an entire four page roasting vegetable primer. Love it. <laughs> because it's the same technique, but each vegetable sometimes has a little bit, um, like like little, little tweaks. Little tweaks, you know, they have their own nature. For instance, <clears throat> certain dense vegetables, um, like that are fibrous, like cauliflower or broccoli, I think they're better if you blanch them first. 
So to boil them in salted water for a couple of minutes. It might seem like an extra step, but the result is going to be tender yet crisp and not dry and chewy. Yeah, so it's worth it. And you can do that step a day or two ahead. And then you have convenience food. Didn't even think of that. Brilliant. Yeah, food literacy. <laughs> <laughs> Learn something every single time. Oh, beautiful question. What did you discover about yourself when you're writing this book, despite how you've been cooking for forever? Well, it really was an extraordinary journey. Um, I have been cooking the seasonal way, teaching and hoping to help people learn that, you know, as we struggle through our busy lives, that supporting our local farmers and cooking this way sort of is the answer to a whole lot. And when I started looking through the lens of how I cook for the Jewish holidays, I realized I didn't change my approach to all of that we've just been talking about today. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, there's something here. Yeah. And as I started to explore, I really realized, I mean, I understood that I had access to seasonal ingredients for those particular holidays. I don't know how many of you celebrate any of the Jewish holidays, but it was more than just, oh yes, they're in season now. I began to see how the synchronicity of what we do seasonally and sustainably and how the ancient lessons are, you know, what they're, they're already there in, I reread the Bible for agriculture and food yeah. and it's all right there. And, you know, having nothing to do with religion but having to do with history and reading and remembering we didn't, you know, we didn't invent everything yesterday. And sometimes it's good to remember. Absolutely. And what happened is it it um, it expanded that sense that I already had of being grateful to the farmers who grow my food, and expanding that to an even greater degree. That the seasonal Jewish kitchen, a fresh take on tradition, is really about a global patchwork of really interesting regional cuisines. Jewish or not, people tend to think that Jewish cooking is deli, you know, matzo ball soup, things like that. But it's so much more. It's an entire world of food. And um, the European tradition that we know so well in this country is just one aspect. And I really wanted to just open up that that box, you know, that way of thinking. And I hope you'll take a look and enjoy the book. All right. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you so much for your time. Well, and thank you. I had a great time. Oh, me too. Okay. Me too. Absolutely. Hopefully you'll come back and see us again. Great.